What's up guys, it's Dalmatter here, and today we're going to be reacting to Refuting Misconceptions About Monarchism. Uh, this is from Lavender, I believe is how you pronounce the name of the channel. And I'm interested to see what they say here, because monarchism can obviously vary greatly depending on, you know, which part of the world and which period in history you're talking about. Um, so I feel like the, a lot of the misconceptions around monarchism is because they are very specific to a certain era or a certain type of monarchism. Um, but there definitely are a ton of misconceptions about monarchism. Um, that being said, the fact that it's in English, I assume it'll be talking mostly about the English monarchy, but, you know, maybe not. Maybe they'll, you know, get into, like, the HRE, uh, which was a democratic monarchy, as weird as that sounds, and other stuff like that. But anyway, link to the original video down below. This is Ris Myth Refuting Misconceptions About Monarchism by Lavender. Is brought to you by my kind Patreon supporters and channel members. If you enjoy my content and seek to take your support a step further, you can freely join my Patreon or become a channel member with several added benefits. With that out of the way, enjoy today's content. I don't know where that is, but that's gorgeous. Monarchism is perhaps one of the most misunderstood political systems in the world. Most people have moved away from the idea of monarchism because they deem it to be an old system from the Middle Ages that is in no way superior to modern republics. The majority of us are probably already familiar with the stereotypical presentation of a king or emperor, a man sitting on a golden throne in his castle, hoarding all the money for himself, living a life full of luxury, all the while his subjects lack basic needs like food and healthcare. This, so this, yeah, again, like this is like what he's talking about here is a very specific type of monarchism um, that it, it's usually associated with feudalism, and it's not entirely true because a lot of the time these kings would be overthrown, right? Uh, I think it's CPG Gray. I can't remember the name of the video. It's like uh, the keys to power or something like that. I can't remember. Um, but he talked. He talks about how like you know whether you're monarchy or democracy or whatever. You have to keep certain people on your side in order to maintain power, and that's very true. Even in a, in a you know in a monarchy, you have to keep your nobles happy, and if your nobles want to maintain power, they have to keep their peasants happy. Now, is this as you know beneficial as a republican system for the average person? Probably not. Uh, but again, <clears throat> it'll vary from monarchy to monarchy depending on how good the the ruler is sort of stereotype has been portrayed in many cartoons, movies, and comic books. And thanks to these stereotypes, many people have the impression that a king is something backwards from days gone by, and insist that people who still believe in the ideology of monarchism are anti-progressive, stuck in the medieval period. And as I said, monarchism today is not exactly popular, except if you speak of countries which already are monarchies in the modern day. But I am specifically referring to strict republican nations in which just the idea of a monarchy is something to laugh at, and that's why in these nations you won't really find much support for monarchism. And as a monarchist who lives in a strictly republican nation, I can confirm this. The few people in real life I have revealed my monarchist views to always ask the same questions. Why do we need a king in this day and age? Don't you believe that people need to have a say in who runs their nation? Won't a king trample our freedoms? Isn't monarchy just a dictator, a tyrant, and so on? Yeah, so, uh, why do we need a king today? That one's very subjective. <clears throat> Don't people have the right to be heard? Um, depends. I mean, like, look at, like, a lot of stuff like the modern social justice movement and shit. And you could argue no, because they're just complaining about shit that's not even real half the time, right? And even when you present them with evidence as to why it's not real, they don't care, right? There's some conspiracy theory that makes it real, um, you know, whether that be like, you know, white supremacy or the patriarchy or whatever. Uh, you know, you, you, it's, it's basically the God of the Gaps fallacy applied to whatever their particular cause is. Uh, won't a kingdom limit for our freedom? Again, that depends entirely on the king, right? If you look at like places like Liechtenstein, the UK... Um, you know, these are very advanced, free, for the most part, nations. And a lot of the freedoms you see limited in the UK are limited by the parliament. They're not limited by the the, the king, right, or, or the queen up until last year. Um, isn't monarchy just a fancy dictatorship? Um, it depends on what kind of monarchy, right? Are you talking about, like, an absolute monarchy? Then yes. Are you talking about, like, a constitutional monarchy like the UK? Then obviously no, right? The UK is one of the most democratic countries in the world. 
and it's still a monarchy. Go on. And seeing how monarchism is not exactly popular in the world, you don't see Marcus that commonly on your average social media page, especially YouTube. But here I am today to finally join in as a defender of monarchist and traditional values, alongside many other of my friends who helped me write the script for this video. Without further ado, let's address our very first myth about monarchism. We will start off with perhaps the most famous claim about monarchism, and that monarchism is just too expensive. Why should we pay money to one man who can then choose to spend it on whatever he wants? Yeah, so this is funny because like taxes nowadays are a lot higher than they were under most historical monarchies, right? Taxes under, you know, republics or democracies or, uh, you know, whatever in a lot of countries are higher than they were under previous monarchist systems. Now, not only is the claim that all tax money goes to the monarch completely false, but also that it doesn't really work that way, and it's not as black and white as it may seem. Let's take the United Kingdom as- Yeah, that's also true. In a lot of monarchies, you know, especially like in feudalism, you pay taxes to your, usually a minor lord, right? If you were a peasant, you paid taxes to a minor lord. That minor lord would then pay taxes to the, the, the major lords. Um, you know, somebody of like a higher ranking nobility, and then it would go up the chain until eventually it got to the king. So it, it, it was very much similar to like how, you know, it, it, it would be like if you pay taxes to your county, but instead of your county having like, you know, whatever the head of the county is called in whatever area you live in, um, they would be, you know, born into that position instead of elected. And then it would go to your, you know, your province or your state, except instead of your, you know, premier or governor being elected, they would be born into that position. And then it would go from them up to the king, except, you know, your king is obviously born into that position instead of, you know, being elected president or prime minister or whatever. Um, but yeah, it, it, it instead of paying like a bunch of taxes, you'd just pay taxes to one person and it would just move its way up the ladder. And again, and the, the amount of taxes would vary greatly depending on, you know, your lord and his lord and his lord and his, you know, all the way up the chain. As an example, currently the government pays around 100 million pounds each year to maintain the royal family, which means that an average British citizen pays the royal family around 4.5 pounds each year through taxes, which is certainly not a lot. But one thing almost never mentioned is the fact that the royal family personally holds a good chunk of land known as the royal estate, and it is through these estates that the royal family earns about 312 million pounds each year, or to be exact, it's what they should be earning. Every single British monarch not only that, but the, the, the British royal family owns a lot of land in other countries too, like Canada and Australia and etc. Um, a lot of this is held in trust by the local government. So like Canada, they have what's called crown land, um, which is technically owned by the queen, well, I guess not the king, um, but is held in trust by the Canadian government. So it's used as public land. But if you actually <clears throat> get down to the brass tacks of who owns it, it's technically the monarchy. Since the times of George III, has voluntarily turned over all the profits from the estate towards the government, and in return, the government would give them an annual salary. Meaning that the United Kingdom earns around 200 million pounds every year thanks to the royal family. The royals are perfectly able to sustain themselves without taxpayer money, mm -hmm. and would be earning three times more than what they already earn. And if the royals... And that, that's not even bringing into the fact the amount of tourism money that comes from the royal family, right? Now, this if everyone had a royal family, this would obviously go away, right? Uh, but a big factor in a lot of British tourism is the fact that they have, like, real nobles and real, uh, you know, royalty. And you can, like, go and visit these palaces and, like, pay, you know, ridiculous amounts of money to, like, go see this shit. And it brings in a lot of tourism for, you know, the UK. Um, now, a lot of that, if, if everyone had a monarchy, a lot of that would go away because it wouldn't be so unique and it wouldn't be so fancy. Uh, so that's obviously something that they kind of have the luxury of just because they're one of the few monarchies that still exist. And then also, you know, the British Empire being the, the largest empire in history and the Anglo-speaking world, you know, the, the 
the Canada, the United States, Australia, New Zealand, the, the white parts of South Africa, having a large part of them having descent from the UK, that's like their historical monarchy. So there's also that that like makes a lot of them want to go and visit like the the homeland, for lack of a better term. Uh, th- those are like huge contributing factors to it. Decided to take back all their deserved revenue from the estates, the government would actually be losing money, which in return means that taxes would be increased on ordinary citizens and not decreased as many would believe. But I hear you saying, why don't we just confiscate all that land and take all the profits for ourselves? Well, in this case, if the crown estates were privatized, the government would only be earning a specified amount from the corporate tax and all other revenue would go to the company itself. So the United Kingdom would still be losing more money and only getting a small amount of the revenue. Point being, it is thanks to the royal family that the average British citizen is paying less in taxes than they would if the monarchy was abolished. Thanks to the fact that the royal family generously hands over all their privately earned profit to the government in exchange for a fixed salary. Not only that, but historically, monarchs have taxed the people just enough so they could rule without problems, and the people weren't so much taxed to have the need to revolt. Modern monarchs usually have side businesses that pay people or organize charity events that they pay completely. Another example is the Habsburgs, who also got their money from the government. By the 19th century, Care to guess how much of the state budget was allocated to maintain the Habsburg family? Only about 0.5 to 1%, which in that period was the same amount spent on the construction of new roads. Under monarchies, the monarch has to think in terms of his or her lifespan. If he taxes the nation into poverty in just a couple years, he'll become destitute. If he wants to not even just their lifespan, but the lifespan of their children, right? If they, a lot of, you know, when it came to monarchies, a lot of it was keeping your line on the throne. And if you, you know, pissed off everyone, then it would be much more likely that they would overthrow either you or your descendant if your descendant wasn't as good of a ruler as you. And, you know, that that's definitely, you know, long-term strategic thinking is definitely something that would happen much better under monarchies. Whereas nowadays you have, you know, prime ministers or presidents or whatever it is, and a lot of them have term limits, and the term limits, you know, there's some benefits to them, right? It's much harder for them to gain absolute power over time. But it's also much more difficult for them to have any long-term strategy because, you know, they get in there the first term. Use the United States as an example. They get in there the first term. The entire first term, they're just trying to make sure they get elected again, right? And then the second term, they can do whatever they want with no repercussions because they're not going to get elected again either, anyway, right? So it puts them in this situation where the first term they don't do anything, you know, too extreme because they're you know just trying to get reelected. The second term they can really fuck up shit as bad as they want and make you know make a profit and fuck off, sell your country out to foreigners, um, which you do see a lot of that in you know modern Western countries where they like literally sell these countries out to the highest bidder of foreign countries a lot of the time. Who not only like are these countries not our allies, but they're actively aggressive against us, and we still have you know presidents and prime ministers and shit selling out the nations to those people to pass the state to his children, he needs to have a long time preference because they are like owners of property. Since the state is theirs, they don't want to damage it and are encouraged to tax the minimum needed to achieve his desired living standards slash goals and then leave the rest of the economy to maximize its growth so they can work on long time projects that will affect positively the nation and don't cause problems for when their children will rule. The opposite of a quote-unquote democratic society, where its leaders are not the owners of the state, but renters of it, thus no reason to make long-time improvements. No democratic leader owns their society, and so has no incentive to think beyond the next election. True. And this is why politicians are so negligent with spending, inflation, debt, and unlike a king and his heirs, Democratic leaders don't have to deal with the consequences of their actions, so to maximize their impact, they begin to spend as much money as quickly as possible before their term expires, thus destroying the whole nation. 
So, no. Yeah, and then when, you know, the inevitable economic collapse happens four, ten, whatever amount of years later, depending on what kind of system they implemented, they can just blame the next guy, right? Oh, look at how great it was under me. Yeah, sure, these economic policies I put in place, you know, caused massive rippling effects downstream in, in you know, history. Uh, but I wasn't there, so it's not my fault. My Probably the best example of this is how people blame Bush for the 2008 financial crisis, despite the fact that the, the bills that caused that were put in place by Clinton. Right? It was the, I, I think it's called the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac um, housing policies was one of the main things that caused the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, but people usually blame that on George Bush, right? And, yeah. Or, the, or, the, or you know, another good example is, you know, Bill Clinton, h him being, like, you know, lauded for how well the economy was doing despite the fact that it was, you know, the, the first internet bubble, which you could argue was caused by, I believe it was, who's in power in the si 1964? Was it Eisenhower? So a lot of the defense contracting that was going on back in the 60s led to, ironically led to a massive increase in the economy in the 90s and then Clinton gets credit for it despite the fact that it had something to do with 30 years that happened before him. Monarchs do not hoard all the taxpayer money for themselves and spend it on whatever they want. Rather, monarchies come of economic benefit to the nation and the entire population. Monarchs have an actual reason to invest into their country because their children will inherit it in the end. Unlike democratic leaders who can come to power, spend as much money as possible, and leave so that the next one may deal with the issues. Yep. Got a cold? Yeah, so this is, I would say this is definitely the biggest issue you have. And, and this is more a critique of democracy than it is of monarchy, or than it is a lauding of monarchy, because there's other systems that, you know, you can look at the Chinese system and how, you know, they kind of have the same thing, especially now that, you know, she is removed. Uh, term limits, right? He can continuously run that country and then you may have one of his sons run it afterwards or, you know, Korea is obviously not a great example because the country is a fucking shithole. Um, but, you know, in Korea, you know, they have, he has more worry about maintaining power than, you know, long-term power than fucking, uh, you know, a lot of Western leaders do. And he's not selling out his people, you know, as many criticisms as you can make about the guy. He's not selling out his people to foreigners. <laughs> That's for sure. This is probably one of the most popular arguments against a monarchy. Why should someone, by virtue of being born to the right parents, have the right to exert power, whether absolute or not, over anyone else? I want to answer this with one simple question. Is there a completely fair way for someone to get into a high position of power, no matter the means? Why should someone who said the right kind of words to the right kind of people hold power over the entire nation, and not to mention the numerous ways these people get into positions of power in a republic? And I am not just talking about votes. Just because someone for example, became president of a democratic nation through seemingly democratic means, doesn't mean that they got that position 100% fairly. Think about all the times these people used corruption to their advantage, how they can be greedy and just how many times they lied to the very people that got them into power. But sure, it is more fair just because more people approve of them. A monarch, or specifically an heir, doesn't need to start a campaign, lie to his people, and use corruption because his position of power is already solidified from the very moment he or she exists in his mother's womb. In this case, all that needs to be done is to educate the young heir on how to run the nation as he gets older, and most of the time, monarchs who were educated from a young age on what to do and how to run the nation when they get into power have a higher possibility of being better rulers than a president who got into office from absolutely no previous experience or knowledge on what to do in that position. Also, it is important to say that having an heir makes politics and geopolitics much easier in that nation. You cannot rig whoever becomes the next monarch the same way one can rig an election. Nor can you say for certain who will win the next election or elections afterwards. Unlike I mean, that's kind of true right obviously you can assassinate people or place somebody else on the throne right you've seen that throughout history now that's definitely much more difficult today um but historically it has happened 
Yeah. Like in a monarchy where you can say with confidence exactly who will be in charge for the next couple of decades. Not to mention that inheritance is not just something practiced by a certain royal family. Rather, normal day people practice it as well. For example, a farmer will almost always let his son or sons inherit his farm with all the fruits and vegetables. Even businesses are known to be passed down from the father to the son or daughter. Even in this modern world, one can still find businesses that pass down the ownership to their relatives. If one can inherit property, wealth, furniture and titles, why is it so horrible to imagine that a person will inherit power as well? One cannot deny that in our modern world today, the idea of democracy is one of the most important systems a nation should have. The belief that the people should have a right to elect their leaders and steer the nation in the way they want it to go. And in most cases, Marxism is seen as the opposite, where the people are ruled by a king or queen who have the final say in terms of internal and foreign policy. But the truth of the matter is, monarchism is not mutually exclusive with democracy. People tend to mix up the term democracy with republic, true. but a democracy can only truly exist in a republican state. Not true. Um, it can only maintain itself in a republican state, but you can have short-lived democracies, right? You see, you see a lot of this throughout history, probably most notably the Greeks, right? The Greeks didn't have a republic, but they had short-lived periods of democracy. Now, I agree in terms of like long-term you know, t like on a, on a large enough time scale, yes, democracy can only exist within a republic, which is a very specific type of democracy. Um, but it, it can exist outside of that for short periods of time and has uh, multiple times in history. But history has shown otherwise. If we look at the nations of Europe after the Age of Enlightenment, we will see that the majority of monarchs at the turn of the 20th century were constitutional and had a democratic system already in place. Whereas, when we look at republics from that point forward, we will find that republics were vastly more authoritarian than your average European monarchy. The truth is, democracy and republicanism are definitely not the same thing. A republic is not always a democracy, as history has shown us with countries like the USSR, Yugoslavia, the Federal Republic of Austria, and the list goes on. So... The, this is kind of true. Like, it depends on what you mean. Like, if you mean republic in the ideology, then yes, a republic is always a type of democracy. If you mean republican name, then very clearly no, right? Like, a good example of this is the Democratic People's Republic of North Korea, right? Very clearly not a democracy, um, despite the fact that it's in its name. So it it depends. Do you mean shit, shit that calls itself that, or do you actually mean, like, the ideology? Because... In the ideology, yes, but there's a lot of countries that call themselves republics that very clearly aren't. Um, but again, but he is kind of right. right? Republics and democracies are most like a republic is a type of democracy. But so all, all republics are democracy, but not all democracies are republics. Um, that, that's the, I guess that's the best way to put it. By definition, democracy is quote. A system of government in which the people of a country can elect their representatives. And that is exactly how democracy works in monarchies. While the people cannot vote for the head of state, i.e. the king, they can still very much vote for their representatives. Like the prime minister, members of parliament, and also the leaders of their local administration. And then these representatives will work alongside the king to ensure the stability of the country. But of course, just like with republics, monarchies are not immune to autocracies, as we have seen with a few royal dictatorships and absolute monarchies. But the vast majority of monarchies, specifically in Europe at the turn of the 20th century, were constitutional, like for example the United Kingdom, which is still a monarchy to this day with a democratic system. But the United Kingdom was not the first constitutional monarchy we know of, we know for a fact that the first recorded constitutional monarchy in the world was the Hittite Empire from over 1500 BC. <laughs> where I love how he says that with his accent, Hittite. In English it's usually pronounced Hittite. While the king was the supreme ruler of the land, many officials exercised independent authority over various branches of the government. Point being, democracy is not mutually exclusive with monarchism. 
specifically in a constitutional monarchy where elections can still be held and where people may elect their representatives. And republics are not always democracies either. If anything, the majority of republics in the 20th century were more authoritarian than monarchies. One could still use the argument that constitutional monarchies are just crowned republics, but as long as there is a king on the throne, even if he is just ceremonial, then the country is still, by definition, a monarchy. For many people, the term monarchy evokes images of knights in shining armor and kings and queens from days long past. True. This image perpetuates the idea that the monarchy is an inherently outdated system that cannot possibly function in the modern post-industrial age. Which is kind of ridiculous because, again, if you look at like the UK, one of the most advanced, powerful countries in the world, monarchy. Liechtenstein, one of the richest countries in the world, although obviously very small, monarchy. Um, you know, there's a lot of very powerful and or rich countries that are still monarchies. But this assumption is completely false and misleading. The institution of monarchy is not only compatible with the modern world and as effective as republican systems, but in my opinion, and the opinion of many others, it is even better than the alternatives. This notion stems from the fact that in most people's minds, the terms democracy and republic are synonymous, as I've stated, and that monarchies and democracies are incompatible. Nevertheless, 43 countries in the world still have some form of monarchy today, so it is not as unpopular as one might first think. Not only are almost a quarter of the world's countries still monarchies, but of the 10 countries with the highest quality of life, five are monarchies. So how is it that an outdated system is not only still practiced in many countries, but also produces one of the highest quality of life for its citizens? The answer is simple. It's not an outdated system. First of all, if you say that monarchy is an outdated system because it was created thousands of years ago, then surely you must agree that democracy is equally outdated because it was already practiced in ancient Greece. Just because a system has been practiced for a long time does not mean that it cannot adapt to the times. Secondly, this is uh, this is honestly an argument you hear from a lot of people about a lot of things. It's old, therefore it's bad, which is just ridiculous. And you, you hear this all the time, and not even just about like monarchies, but about just pretty much anything. People say, oh, it's, you know, that's the old way of doing things. Old equals bad. The monarchies have proven time and time again that they can work well alongside democracies, as I have explained previously. Most monarchs that still exist have adapted to the modern world. The days when monarchs ruled by the grace of God are long gone. Instead, they now rule based on a social contract in which both the monarch and the people live in a symbiotic relationship. The monarch also acts as a neutral voice in a democratic system, representing all citizens of a country, not just those who voted for the largest political party. This example can be seen in many countries such as Britain, Norway, Denmark, Sweden, the Benelux countries, etc. But even in the days of absolute monarchs and feudal lords, People like Charlemagne and Louis XIV could only dream of the powers that presidents and prime ministers have in some republics, which shows that monarchies can work better in some cases. From all this, we can see that the institution of monarchy is not obsolete and can function well in modern society. Correct. Hot beats. Yeah, so a, lo a lot of that is kind of, it, it, is, it is true, but a lot of that power comes a lot more from technological development than it does really anything else, right? It, a lot of the power that modern systems have comes from technological development more so than the actual system itself, right? Um, you know, the ability to have, like, mass communications across the entire country obviously make it much easier to have your fingers and your eyes and your ears everywhere than back in the day where... It would take literal months for information from the other side of the kingdom to get to you. One of the biggest issues a government can face, and considering how much people talk about corrupt politicians and rulers, it's no surprise that many like to say that monarchy is a corrupt system in of itself. But it's clear that people don't really understand what corrupt means. 
Just yeah. because someone has political power and is wealthy does not make them inherently corrupt. Yeah, there's obviously nepotism, but nepotism does not equal corruption, right? And I think that's the big problem is people use those words synon like as synonyms, and they're not synonyms. They can be, but they can be the same thing in certain situations, but they're not synonyms. Um, you know, cor like look at how corrupt America is, for example. There's massive amounts of corruptions and everyone knows it. But they haven't had a monarchist system since 1776. Nevertheless, if we look at history, we will find that there were indeed a few corrupt kings or emperors. But as I said, only a few. The reason being is that monarchs don't really have a reason to be corrupt. The main reason why people engage in corruption in the first place is because of two things. Money and power. Yep. But monarchs are already covered with both of these things from the moment they are born, to the moment they let out their last breath. And this is the reason why so many monarchs weren't corrupt, simply because they didn't need to engage in corruption. Now some may point to a few monarchs like King Louis XVI and Nicholas II, whose countries were embroiled in revolution due to their quote-unquote corruption of hosting parties and presumably not caring about the lower classes. Yeah, that's not really corruption, that's just incompetence. But that isn't corruption, no. it's just negligence. And most people confuse acts of negligence for acts of corruption. Republics, on the other hand... Oh boy, is there a lot to unravel here. Now, we wouldn't really say that republics are inherently more corrupt, but rather they open oh, they up the are, possibility undeniably. of corruption a lot more. Republics are inherently more corrupt, that's undeniable. Right? Anyone who says otherwise is delusional. Like, the, the, especially ones that have term limits, right? Term limits are one of the worst things. Like, I, I guess kind of both, right? Because if you don't have term limits, then you're going to have corruption so that you can continue to stay in power. And if you do have term limits, then you're going to be corrupt because you can't maintain power for a long time, so you got to get that bag while you're in there. So many politicians, prime ministers, and presidents have been embroiled in corruption scandals and court cases that it's almost impossible to keep track of them all. That's why today when we hear that a politician is exposed for corruption, we don't act shocked, we just see it as another Tuesday. There are plenty of reasons why politicians are... True. I mean, look at like the Watergate scandal back in, what was it, 1976, I think? Maybe 74. Um, a big, massive scandal, right? And then we've had like probably five Watergate scandals, like Watergate level scandals over the last like two to three years between the Biden and Trump administrations. And nobody fucking cares. In Canada, where I live, uh, Justin Trudeau has had, like, a major scandal, I would say, at least once every six months. And he's still been reelected twice, right? Because so many people view it as, like, team sports. So in order to admit, like, they're just like, yeah, there's going to be corruption no matter what. But at least it's my guy that's corrupt, not your guy, right? They won't vote out the corrupt guy because then your corrupt guy would get in instead of my corrupt guy so likely to turn to corruption, and it always includes power and money. As I've previously stated, monarchs don't really have a reason to engage in corruption because they are already secured of both. Politicians, on the other hand, have every reason to engage in them. Their positions are always temporary, a couple years at most and they are out, so they try to make the best of their status yep. as they can, get as much money and power as possible before their time is up. This is all made worse with a system of lobbying in a democratic republic. For those who are not aware, lobbying is the act of persuasion in politics for politicians to support a certain decision which they in the beginning did not support or were neutral. And I think you can definitely see how corrupt this system can get, since majority of the time, politicians get bribed by a certain group to support a bill that is in their favor. A famous example of this is when Walt Disney lobbied Congress to reform the copyright system just so they could retain personal ownership of their character Mickey Mouse. If anything, the modern world has proven that corruption is a lot more rampant in republics, but as I stated, it does not mean that republicanism is a corrupt system in of itself. In fact, I do not believe any system is inherently corrupt. But just like with republics, it doesn't mean monarchism is corruption-free, especially when we consider the parliaments. But to say that the monarch is corrupt in of itself is an entirely different story, and if anything, the monarch is the least corrupt figure in the country.
Monarchy is obviously not a perfect system. In fact, no political system in this world is perfect. But the amount of slander monarchism gets from people who do not fully understand or comprehend it is just unfair. They see a rich man sitting on a golden throne with all the money in the world in the media and instantly conclude that this is all they really need to know about the whole system. As I have demonstrated, monarchism can be far more complicated than just a guy sitting in a castle with a lot of money. And people think that the position of a monarch is a privilege, but this assumption is far from right. Truth of the matter is, being a king is one of the most difficult positions a man can find himself in. A king stands alone against all who wish harm upon his people. He, without a sense of safety, has to have the will and duty to fight against all the evil in the world. Think about this and all the burdens this man has to carry, the expectations he needs to meet, and the duty that he has. Think of all this next time you envy the position of a monarch. As Sir Fulke Greville stated, quote, The greatest slave in a kingdom is generally the king of it. End quote. Yeah, so that was a pretty good video. <clears throat> and uh, I agree with most of the points he made. I wouldn't really consider myself a monarchist just because, you know, like if we look at, if we look at the systems we have, we have republicanism, right? Which is obviously, you, you know, we see the massive amount of corruption in the United States. You have constitutional monarchies like the UK, but then because of how neutered the monarchy is there, you see more corruption there than you do in the U.S., right? Like, at least in the States, when the conservatives get elected, the conservatives have the power to do conservative things. Um, you know, now whether they will or not, it's a whole other story because half them are fucking spineless and they'll just bend over backwards to, you know, prove that they're just as woke as the lefties. Um, but the, in, the, in the UK, they literally, they'll pay lip service to it, but the second they get into power, 100% of the time, they're just not going to do it, right? Like, the, the, the they've had, like, what, four or five conservative prime ministers in a row now, all of which have been voted out by the conservatives themselves because they refuse to do anything the conservatives actually want them to, that their own voter base wants them to. They're just fucking lefties in disguise. Um, and, you know, the, the king slash queen can't do anything about it because I mean they have they're neutered they have no power um and then obviously with absolute monarchy you know sure the king is effective but then you get an incompetent one or you know one that decides to be particularly cruel or whatever it is and then you know next thing you know you have the russian revolution so it really does seem like there's no winning with these systems unfortunately but um, I don't know. What do you guys think? Let me know down below. Pro-monarchy, anti-monarchy, somewhere in between. I'm kind of neutral on the whole thing. I think, you know, a, a lot of the system really has to do with the people within it and what, you know, what the people are willing to tolerate and, you know, how much they get involved in this my team versus your team bullshit, which we see a lot of people do today where, you know, the, you know, because, and not even like team in terms of ideology, but teams in term of, uh, in terms of political party, because at least with an ideology, you can you know stand behind your ideology and have principles to stand behind. But most people now, it's just about their political party. Their their party can completely switch what they believe on something, and they'll follow them to the bitter end. They won't you know call them out for being you know fucking useless. Like that's one thing I appreciate about the UK Conservatives is you know the UK Conservatives they vote for the Conservative Party, but they constantly get fucked over by the Conservative Party. They'll boot that person out of power, get another one. Get fucked over by that one, boot that person out of power, get another one, and you know. So as useless as the UK Conservative Party is, at least the voters understand that um, and they're standing behind their principles. But anyway, let me know what you think. Like, comment, subscribe. We'll see you in the next one.